Let's begin our service by praying together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's say together the summary of the law. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts, that we may obtain forgiveness by His infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God. But especially when we come together in His presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at His hands, to declare His most worthy praise, to hear His holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. And let's pray together for the forgiveness of our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's reaffirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen to the Word of God. Our scripture reading for this morning is taken from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians, chapter 4. We begin at verse 1. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, 
born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Who are you? This morning, we're going to look at the Apostle Paul's reminder of us of who we are. But let's pray first. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be truly acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So we're looking at Paul's letter to the Galatians chapter 4 verses 1 to 7. And let me remind you of the context of Paul's words. In the course of the 30 years or so which had elapsed between the Apostle Paul's dramatic conversion experience along the road to Damascus when Jesus had appeared to him, and now his imprisonment in Rome, the Apostle Paul had traveled extensively as a preacher of the good news. And as he made his way talking about Jesus in various towns and cities, uh, communities of faith began to spring up. And we would, of course, call them churches. They weren't of a particular denomination, but a collection of local congregations. The letter to the church of Galatia is addressed to a church located somewhere in what we would know now as Central Turkey. Paul had planted a church and he is in a conversation with them through his letter. And so here he is filling in the blanks and describes what it means to be a Christian. So let's take a closer look. I mean that an heir, as long as he's a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he's under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but there are some words here that might describe the Exodus story in the Old Testament. So, for example, God had called Moses to lead his enslaved people to freedom in the promised land. You know the story. And after a very long time, 400 years in slavery, the time was right. Just like what it says in verse 4, when the fullness of time had come. So, God sent Moses to redeem his people, that is, to purchase their freedom from slavery. And of course, you know the rest of the story. Their freedom was secured at the Passover with the sacrifice of the lamb and the blood over the doors of the Israelites' homes. And at the same time, the slaying of all the Egyptian firstborn. Then, when the people had escaped from Egypt, they came to Mount Sinai, 40 days after that Passover, and then they were given the law as their guide through the wilderness to their inheritance, which would eventually be the promised land. And so a a Jewish reader would be thoroughly familiar with this story. Now, in our next section, Paul explains about how Jesus is, in fact, enacting a, as it were, new exodus. This time, not Moses, but Jesus is sent, born of a human mother, to purchase his people, by the shedding of his own blood, 
mirroring that first Passover. And in another truly amazing parallel of the Exodus account, 40 days later, during the Feast of Pentecost now, God gave not the law, but the gift of the Holy Spirit, which would enable a person in the very depth of their being to know Almighty God as his or her Abba, Father. Verse 4, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoptions as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So let's look closer at this uh, section, verses 4 to 7. God decides to intervene. And we could say that basically that is the message of Christmas, couldn't we? But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And notice that God's purpose was to do two things, to redeem or buy our freedom and to adopt us into the family. What Paul is doing here is using an illustration from his day. He is speaking from a primarily Greek context. Paul uses a legal device whereby, let's say a man who had no children at that time, might take into his family a slave youth to help with his business. So imagine, let's say a, a young slave boy. He's 17 years old. All he's known for his 17 years is working and being and serving various people as a slave. Day in, day out, he's a slave. All of a sudden, by some miracle, he's not a slave anymore, but he becomes an actual son. And not only that, an heir to his new father's fortune. He is fully adopted as a son with all the rights of a natural born son. I always admire people who decide to adopt children. They open up their homes and their hearts to love and take responsibility for another human life. Paul is telling us that adoption is a picture of what God does for you and me. Another one of the readings on, uh, at this time of year is from John chapter 1. And the Christmas story, of course, is about the beginning of our adoption. So from John 1, verse 12, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, that is Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. God makes us a part of his family. Full sonship, a son has full rights and privileges. And I'm sure that any of the women who are watching this have noticed me using the words sons, son. Remember that at that time that this was written, it was a very male culture. And St. Paul is quite unique in his writing in a culture that considered women as second-class citizens, he is in fact putting both men and women into a very honored and equal place. Paul is talking of those who are in Christ Jesus, those who believe in Jesus. And this comes out a bit more with more clarity in verse 7. So, 
you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. You see, what's happening here is the Apostle Paul suddenly shifts from the second person plural to the second person singular. It's like he's, he, it's like he's saying, you, pointing his finger at the reader, pointing the finger at the, the screen right now. You, not just man, you, 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 you're no longer a slave, but a true child, an heir with Almighty God. And until you, and I mean each and every one of you, have heard what Paul is saying here, his message has not gotten through. You are a precious son, a precious daughter, an adopted child of God. So Paul is using a literary device to emphasize who we really are. And I'm sure if he could have jumped off the page of the scriptures, if he could jump right through this screen into where you are right now, this is what he would have wanted to do. When the right time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman. And of course, the Christmas story tells us that God sent his son into our world to share our condition and then, amazingly, to change our condition. He is born, as it were, under the law of Moses. We know that Jesus was fully Jewish. In other words, he valued the Old Testament scriptures. He not only valued it, he lived it. He was born under the law and he perfectly fulfilled the law. He actually did it. He lived the Ten Commandments perfectly. He is fully righteous. And without fully explaining this here, Paul writes, verse 5, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And so to repeat those two points earlier, God's purpose was to do two things, to save us and to adopt us. You see, earlier in chapter 3, Paul tells us basically that anyone who is trying to rely on following the Ten Commandments, the law, has to follow them perfectly. It's like when people say, well, I'm, I'm a good person. Well, in order for us to get to heaven with that uh, philosophy, we need to do that perfectly. We need to be fully good. So we're obviously in a bit of a predicament. God gives us a standard to follow, but we fail. At the same time, God is holy and just and must deal with all of those who are unholy, who are not perfectly following his rules. But thank God for Jesus, who sets us free by taking our place, our penalty, our judgment on the cross. He saves us. That's what Paul is saying when he writes, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law. And secondly, his purpose also is to adopt us as precious heirs with full rights to the family. Don't you love how the gospel goes further than forgiving our past? He brings us into the family. He says, you are mine. That's what the Father says to you and me. And here's the most amazing news. It's not just a status, it's also an experience by the Holy Spirit. It is a twofold process. The moment we accept Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. This is about status and experience. He wants us to know in our minds our status, but he also wants us to feel it. Verse 6 again. And because you are sons and daughters, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, 
crying, Abba, Father. It's a cry of delight. It's actually a feely word, feeling word. It's a precious heart-rending connection between a child and his or her parent. And as you know, Abba is the Aramaic word for father. The word is actually daddy or dad. Dada. Jesus uses this word when he prays to the God of the universe. And to me, the most striking example of this is when Jesus is praying on the night before he is to suffer on the cross in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prays, Abba, Dad, I trust you. My life is in your hands. And so the apostles valued that and taught the early church to call God Abba, Dad. It's an earthly, earthy word, an intimate word. This is difficult, of course, for some people to accept, especially when their earthly human fathers were distant or or hard or even abusive on them. The point being, of course, is that God invites us, you, into an intimate relationship with himself. And there's no better thing in life than knowing that you are safe in the hands of your Father in heaven, whatever circumstances you're in. And you know, we go through difficult circumstances in life. But no matter what happens, you are a precious son or daughter. And there's an inheritance that is coming beyond this life. There's something, of course, better coming. And so today, I am simply reminding you of who you are. Loved by the Father, an adopted son or daughter, one who is enabled to cry from the very being, from your very being, Abba, Father. And I want to stress here, he's not asking you to do more. He's asking you to trust more. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my friends here gathered. And I pray now by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would remind us of who we are. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray, even now. Bless your people. Bless them, Lord, in the very depths of their hearts with the experience of the Holy Spirit, crying out, Abba, Father. And we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father in heaven, our holy your name, your love and protection to me you have given. You reach down from heaven to touch me. Make my mind.
as we continue on to the prayers of the people this morning, I'm going to pray a number of petitions and pause after each one. I would invite you to offer prayers of your own during these pauses. Let us pray for the church and for the world. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Archbishop Foley, Bishop Dan, Bishop Charlie, and all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially Justin Trudeau, our Prime Minister, and Doug Ford, our Premier. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection and thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We want to pray as well, Heavenly Father, that as we look to this coming year, you would make us more and more into the image of your Son. Lord, purify us, sanctify us. Use this coming year for your glory and your purposes. We surrender ourselves to you with complete faith. And we ask as well, Lord, that you would continue to use us for the purposes of evangelism. Help us to have the great joy, the great privilege of leading people to eternal life. These things, Lord, we ask with thanks for the grace you give to each and every one of us day by day and week by week. And once again, as a congregation united in Christ, we pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue our service with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we pray together the prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us 
and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. The Father's love is deeper than the deepest ocean flow. The Father's love is brighter than the brightest morning star. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Well, God bless you and have a wonderful week. Thanks for joining us.